the end of a very challenging year, God is doing a new thing in Jesus Christ. And what I want to talk about today is that God wants to bring you a new comfort. It doesn't mean that he wants to put you into a comfortable situation. It may be that he wants to bring comfort to you precisely in the place of discomfort. Sometimes we think, man, I can't wait till 2020 is over. There is no guarantee that just because 2021 has a new number at the end, it's going to be a different kind of year. It's going to be a more comfortable year. And we see this in Jesus. This is looking at the beginning of his ministry when he goes into the desert. Today is part two. We saw yesterday where the Spirit drives him out, Mark says, from the river and the place of great comfort into the place of isolation and danger and fear, which is the desert. And Jesus has to learn to say in the desert the prayer that he will need at the end in the garden, your will be done. Mark's telling of this story is very spare. He says he goes into the, temp the desert and he's tempted by Satan. We'll look at the temptation more tomorrow. He's there for 40 days. And then two other wonderful phrases. And now we'll begin to see the comfort of God in the place of discomfort. Uh, Jesus is with the wild animals and he is cared for by the angels. Now, the wild animal thing I had never noticed before, but there's actually great significance to it. A little phrase, wild animals, is uh, made throughout the Bible. Of course, God is the one who created animals. And in Genesis 2, verse 19, it says, God formed the wild animals from the ground, and God brought them to the man, to Adam, in Eden. And this is before the fall, when everything is as God wants it to be. And the man names the livestock and the birds of the air and the wild animals. Now, the idea of naming is not just that he attaches labels to him. This is a deep part of uh, what it means to be human, to be made in the image of God, to exercise dominion. We're able to understand and deal with and get, and we admire people who can train animals, who can bring animals to the fullness of their potential. And God delights in animals. It talks in the Psalms about how the Leviathan frolics in the deep, and God marvels at that. God loves to feed and care for little sparrows in their nest. But since the fall, things are not the way they're supposed to be. And there is this uh, rupture between human beings and animals. So in the ancient world, wild animals are often an image of danger. And if you look, for example, at Psalm 22, the psalmist talks about protect me from the wild bull and the lion and the dogs and the ox that go in. These are images of destructive human beings, but taken from our fear of wild animals. But a day is coming, the scriptures say, a new day when things will be as they ought to be. Every religion, every major worldview carries along with it a diagnosis of what is wrong with the world as we experience it today. And in Buddhism, it's the great problem is desire, uh, is suffering. And, and if we could eliminate desire, that would go away. In Marxism, it is that people are alienated from labor and from life, and a classless society would solve that. Every system has to work this out. And in the view of Christianity and essentially Judaism, the great problem is that things are not the way they are supposed to be. There is a way that the world is supposed to be. Human relationships the way that we relate to God and to creation. And the word for that in the Old Testament is shalom. And it means peace, but it's way more than just the absence of war or the absence of anxiety. Neil Plantinga says it is the rich interweaving together of human beings and creation and God in a spirit of harmony and mutual delight. That's the way that things are supposed to be. Now, one of the images the prophets would use for when shalom will begin as precisely to do with our fear of wild animals. Isaiah chapter 11 is one place where we see it. Uh, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. His roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. That'll be the Messiah. And when that comes, verse six, the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. We don't see that happening now. The young will lie down together. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. And then in Isaiah 65, there's similar language, and it says, but the serpent's food will be dust. The serpent, of course, was the temper, the destroyer of Shalom. The great problem 
Neil says, is sin in Christianity. And sin is the violation of shalom, the culpable violation of shalom. So when Jesus goes into the desert, he is with the wild animals. And Jack Levinson says that little phrase, to be with in Mark, means to be peaceably with. Jesus chooses the disciples to be with him. A man delivered from demons wants to be with Jesus. Jesus realizes in the desert that a part of his mission is to be the restorer of shalom. And it begins with him right there in the place where he does not want to be, in the place of danger. He is with the wild animals. Shalom, that sphere in which all is the way that God wants it to be, that is the severe in which the sphere in which God's will is done, that is the kingdom of God, the range of God's effective will, where shalom happens, begins for crying out loud in the place of danger and temptation in the desert. And Jesus is with the wild animals. And we'll see this occasionally when we look at the lives of great saints. If you uh, uh, ever read about St. Francis of Assisi, who everybody loves, uh, among other things, he is the patron saint of animals. He loved all of God's creation, Brother Sun and Sister Moon. And one of the famous stories about him is one day he's out with his disciples and there's some birds and he leaves them and preaches to the birds and says, uh, brother and sister birds, you should praise your heavenly father for he gave you feathers for clothes and wings so that you can fly. You don't reap or sow and yet he cares for you. So you ought always to praise him. And uh, if Francis had been a Baptist after that, he would have given an altar call. If he'd have been a televangelist, he would have taken an offering. But he was a Franciscan, and so he blessed them. And very often when you see a picture of Francis, it's with animals. It's interesting, at Christmas time, we love nativity scenes, that manger. Francis created the very first one, so far as we know. And he actually had a live ox and a live donkey there because he knew that God means blessing for all God's creatures. Jesus is with the wild animals, and then he's with the angels. And the angels care for him. The angels minister to him. I don't know about you. You may have stories about angels, or you may find it quite easy to believe in angels, or uh, they may be a stretch for you. We live in a world that makes it very difficult to believe in the unseen. C.S. Lewis says that he believes in angels, but not as they're often represented in arts or literature, pictures. Uh, often angels have wings like birds do and demons have wings like bats do. And Lewis says that's not because moral deterioration causes feathers to turn into membrane. It's because we generally like birds more than we like bats. And they have wings at all to suggest unimpeded intellectual energy. And Jesus believed that there were angels, agents of God's care and concern all around him. And in this story, he is with the wild animals and he is under the care, the protection, the guard of angels. Now, what's going on here is spoken of remarkably in a psalm that's a beautiful psalm, Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High rests in the shadow of the Almighty. And then he goes on, if you say the Lord is my refuge, you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up your hand so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. All of this is coming together now in the desert, in the place where Jesus doesn't want to go, in the battle. He is resting in the shadow of the Almighty, and the angels are watching over him. And he's with the wild animals. And this will be true all the way, even to the cross. You might wonder, where were the angels on the cross? That'll be a temptation Jesus faces, just rely on the angels in inappropriate ways. But of course, in that moment, he will say, do you not know I could call on 12 legions of angels? That's like 72,000. So not a day. You may be in the desert. God may not deliver you when 2021 rolls around into the place of comfort. Don't ask God primarily to go into a place of comfort. Receive God's comfort in the uncomfortable place. Allow God to bring to you thoughts, messages, conversations with other people, hope, scripture, to let you know that 
when you are in the desert, in the hard place, if you dwell in the shelter of the Most High, you rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You are a recipient and an agent of Shalom. God bless you tomorrow, the temptation.